Good morning, welcome back to another vid. This is going to be an unboxing or an unpackaging, I guess, of Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds latest album, their third album called Who Built the Moon. So I've bought a bundle of items here. I got them for around about 60 something dollars, which is about 40, 45 pounds. I did buy them on the official Noel Gallagher store. In fact, I pre-ordered them going back maybe three or four months ago, whenever it was. Could even have been longer. So it's all arrived now. The album came out last Friday, which is the 24th. As I'm recording this, it's Thursday the 30th. By the time the video goes up, it's probably going to be Friday, um, which will be a week since it came out. So what I'm going to do, as I always do for these kind of videos, the same that I did for The Verve and for Liam Gallagher's debut album, I'll put a timestamp in the description box. So if you want to skip past all this unboxing and maybe you want to go straight to what I think of the album, then by all means, please feel free to, to click on that. So what I'm going to do, like I say, I'm going to show you what you get for your money, or at least what I got. And there's one particular item which you may or may not be interested in, which is limited to 2,000 copies. So that's not a lot, especially for someone as popular and famous, if you like, as Noel Gallagher. So if you still want that item, uh, you may be able to get in there on time. Uh, some may say it's a little bit gimmicky, it's not going to be for everyone. Uh, but the fact that it's limited to 2,000 is quite appealing. So, let's start off with the album. Like I said, it's called Who Built the Moon. It came out last Friday, and I love the artwork. It is so striking. What I'll also do, maybe not necessarily for, for this part, uh, but for certainly the booklet later on, and other things, I'll put extra photographs. Again, like I did with the other two videos that I've, that I've made when it comes to uh, unboxings. Just so you can see more uh, in more detail, like close-ups and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, really striking artwork. If we open it up and look at the back, it's a continuation which spreads across. It's really like a mixture of uh, futuristic -y and retro, uh, apocalyptic, and yeah, kind of almost sci-fi in a way. Almost enticing, yet quite scary in a way. I, just, I, I love it. I think it looks, it looks absolutely fantastic. The colours are beautiful, and yeah, really striking and vivid, I think so anyway. So when we open it up, we get this kind of very in-your-face artistic, kind of almost 70s design. Looks like something you'd possibly see on like, I don't know, maybe like a Led Zeppelin album or something like Elton John from in the 70s. It's got a kind of uh, 70s vibe to it. And if we open up the, I'll get the vinyl out here, or the sleeve. Again, it's just basically a continuation of the sky with the imagery and lyrics uh, printed on there as well to all the songs. And then if we take the actual album out, then you can see here on side A, they've entitled it Earth Side with the yellow kind of, well, the sun kind of image there. And if you turn it around, this one's called the dark side, for obvious reasons. So yeah, really nice that they've, that they've done that. And, but the actual artwork, I think, looks superb. Really, really nice and very striking. So there's that. Now, the other thing that came part of this bundle was this. Now, you may be thinking, hang on, that looks exactly the same. Uh, same on the back, and if you look in the middle. And it is exactly the same, but the only difference is that when you take this out, as I'll do now, the sleeve, even the sleeve's exactly the same with the lyrics on. The only difference is this, because this is a picture disc. Now, I don't know to what kind of limited quantities we're talking, but this, again, will be limited. I believe it's sold out. I had a look the other day, and it's sold out, which doesn't surprise me, because when picture discs tend to come out, uh, they usually are in limited numbers. So I'm sure you can still find it on eBay. There's always scalpers, aren't there, who want to uh, fleece people. Uh, they'll, they'll buy all the stock up and then they'll sell it on. So, yeah, if you're into your picture discs, then this could be one for you. Uh, I'm not massively into them, but it came part of the bundle, like I say. It's quite nice. It's something nice to have, but I'm not massively into it. What really disappoints me, I mean, I'm not losing any sleep over it, but it would have been nice if the artwork was somehow different. So then if you've got the two together, like I do, I mean, these are basically, they look exactly the same. The only way to differentiate it is, of course, to look at the actual picture disc. But there's nothing which stipulates that it's a picture disc on the front of the artwork or on the spine. So it would have been nice if the colour was slightly different or it had, it had something which made it immediately obvious that this is the picture disc version. So that's a slight complaint, nothing major, but it would have been nice for them to have done that, I guess. Because in the future, if I've got these records side by side, as I will have on this shelf or on any shelf in the future, and if someone walks in and they're like, oh, I see you've got two copies of Who Built the Moon? I'll have to say, well, actually, it's, it's kind of one, um, but it, it, oh, it's just, it makes it so much, or would make it so much more easier if they'd have slightly changed the spine or done something, but maybe I'm just being a little bit fussy on that. 
in terms of the track list, exactly the same. So the only literal difference is the fact that it's on a picture disc. So if you're into them, great. Um, if you're not, then well, I guess you won't really be buying it, will you? And it's sold out anyway, so that's that. And then the other thing you get, there's two more things after this, but it's a deluxe edition of the uh, CD, which comes with a bonus track as well. So that's the main advantage of getting this, as well as the fact that once you take it out of the sleeve, it comes in this little kind of hardback book, uh, you can see there. So again, I'll put some pictures of this so you can see it. I always keep these little stickers. If there's a sticker on, uh, you know, like the protective kind of sheet, that I'll, uh, I'll end up usually keeping it, which is a bit weird. But I know a lot of people do that as well, so uh, we're all weird together, I guess. So there's the artwork. Some really, again, vivid imagery going on. Almost in places, I noticed when I was having a... a that's very kind of science fiction that one. Almost religious. A definite religious undertones going on. Again, that's almost the same uh, that we had a minute ago. Again, there's almost like a futuristic -y, uh, apocalyptic thing going on there. This is the one that I was on about. It kind of looks very religious-esque, doesn't it? So it is really nice. And I'm not going to show them all, but uh, well, I will maybe in the pictures, but not the skipping through here. And I think that's one of the backing singers uh, who was involved in it. Might even keep on reaching. I stand correct on that one. And there's Noel at the end. Um, and then right back, uh, literally, well, penultimate page, I guess, because that's the very back one is just the uh, the artwork. What we've got here is in this little fold out thing is the CD, and it comes in a nice little orange CD, as you can see. Obviously, just a standard CD on the other side. So yeah, the major attraction for this particular package, apart of, do you know what, I'll put that in later, uh, is not just the fact that it comes with a, a hardback, uh, but it also comes with a hardback book, but it also comes with the extra track called Dead in the Water. Now we'll talk about that more at the end of the vid when I'm doing my summing up of the actual album. Um, but yeah, so that's the advantage of buying that. Also, there's a Japanese version, and on the Japanese version, uh, is it like a deluxe version or a super deluxe version? Or maybe it's just the standard Japanese version. But it comes with another track called God Help Us All. Now that song has been knocking around for a few years. So uh, I think most people have heard it. But it's nice to finally, finally have it officially released on an album. Albeit the Japanese version. So I don't think it's going to be enough for me to purchase yet another copy of the record or the CD. Uh, just to have that one track. Uh, but um, who knows, maybe if I see it going in the future or... If it's cheap, if it's maybe different artwork, which I, I don't anticipate it is, then I may grab it. But I'm sure it's going to be on some kind of compilation in the future. So two more things. Uh, we've got this one, which is basically a hand-printed lyric sheet from the song The Man Who Built the Moon, signed at the bottom and dated uh, November 2017. So I'm still in November at the time of making this vid. So it's still relevant. I'm still here in the moment. Um, but that will very quickly change tomorrow when it becomes December. So, December already, unbelievable. Christmas, crazy. So yeah, now, for me personally, I mean, I guess it's a nice little extra, you know, it is actual handwriting, albeit printed, but wouldn't it have been nice if it was genuinely handwritten and not printed? I personally wouldn't have minded, you know, paying an extra 10 quid, 20 quid, 50 quid, maybe even more, you know, 100 quid, uh, or dollars for me being in America. I wouldn't have minded whatsoever doing that. Um, it would have added a little bit more flavour to it, more of an individual kind of touch to it. Uh, would have been more unique. But as it stands, you know, obviously everyone's kind of getting a, a printed lyric sheet. And it, it's kind of nice, don't get me wrong, I'm obviously not going to throw it away. It's nice to have as part of the set. It just would have been nice if it was the actual hand-signed, uh, handwritten, genuine lyric sheet. But it's not the end of the world. If you watched my Liam Gallagher unboxing from a couple of months back, whenever that was, that also came with something similar. But the major difference with that, and I tell you what, I'm probably wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced the one I've got is actually hand-signed. I'm convinced where he's wrote, as you were, on the side. Because there's the indentations, it's almost like, you know what, I touch upon this in, in that video, where, you know, when you're writing on a piece of paper and you lift it up and you can see it in the pe on the pages below or underneath, and it's got that on it, and the ink just looks real. I'm telling you, I'm probably wrong, but I, it looks so real, it's, it's insane. And then the last thing you get with this, and this is what I was talking about before, about the limited run. It's a 3D lenticular print of the artwork. And I don't know if you can see, probably not because of the light, but if you look at the mountains especially, they kind of pop and they shimmer. The lighting may not be great, and apologies for that. Um, it's you know, getting slightly dark as the time of year. So, but it looks really nice. And when you're looking at it, you know, when I'm looking at it in, in real time, uh, in person here, you can really see it popping and striking. You know, the woman standing there and the rocks kind of sticking out. 
and the birds kind of shimmering away in the sky. So it looks really nice. Now, I had an email that came through uh, probably two or three months after I pre-ordered this saying, oh, this is available at a special price because you uh, basically bought the bundle. So instead of paying $20, which is what they want for it, you can get it for like 10 I think it was. And I thought, Do you know what? Why not? You know, it's limited to 2000 It's only $10. That's around about £6.50, give or take. And because of the exclusivity, the limited numbers, I thought that was a really good kind of price. So I did it. Now, I had a look the other day and they're still available. It doesn't give you a number to say how many are available, but it said that there's still some left. Uh, and it is limited, apparently, to 2000 So if you want to pay $20 for it, and shipping, I guess, uh, which is around about £14, give or take, then maybe you should head on over to Noel Gallagher's store online and uh, basically buy it if you want. But it's just, for some, it's going to be quite gimmicky. But I really like it. It looks really cool. You can't really tell. It doesn't do it justice there. You've got to see it in person. So I don't know if you'd want to frame it or put it on the wall, do whatever you want with it, or maybe just keep it with all the records. And um, It's up to you, isn't it? So that's basically what you get for your money. What I'm going to do now is we're going to switch the camera around a little bit and uh, my chops will be, uh, will be on camera and I'll talk a little bit about the album and what I think about it and the general reaction and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, see you in a minute. All right, so, yeah, let's talk about it. Who Built the Moon? Now, rather than just keep looking up and down at the record every five minutes, I've got the track list on the screen, the ever-reliable Wikipedia, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the album, what I think of it, Maybe the reception, the reaction that it's got. And yeah, just overall summing it up, what tracks I like uh, and what I think, basically. So it starts off with Fort Knox. Now, if ever there was an indication that this album is going to be a little bit different to what Noel Gallagher has done before, certainly when it comes to his uh, individual albums or with the High Fine Birds and with Oasis, then this was it. It was a bit of a statement of intent, immediately just saying, look, this album is going to be a little bit different. You're either on board or you're not. So it's basically, for all intents and purposes, a bit of a, an instrumental, if you like, with kind of Amazonian chants going on in the background, uh, really kind of enticing and uh, intriguing. I'll tell you what I could do without, and, and it's the alarm clock, and it's about a couple of minutes in, or just shy of a couple of minutes in. The song lasts around about four-ish minutes, give or take. And, uh, yeah, about one minute, 40-something seconds, an alarm clock starts going off in the background, and it's quite invasive, it's not like just in the background, it's, it almost comes to the forefront and you notice it immediately and then after maybe 20, 30 seconds you're like, it's still going on. And it continues to go on all the way until the end of the, the track. So it's a little bit annoying, I've got to be honest, but you soon get used to it to the point where I quite like it now. And in a way, and this is just interpretation, isn't it? But in a way, it's almost as if, you know, this is a wake up call. This is a new sound. This is a new style from Noel Gallagher. It's a new direction he's going uh, going into. Uh, and if you're on board, great. But if not, well, too bad. But either way, there's an alarm clock going off. It's, uh, it's, it's a wake-up call, essentially. That's my kind of interpretation. Maybe I've looked into it a little bit too deeply there. But I love it. I think it's a really, really good start to the album. Uh, vocals are very, very limited. Uh, he just says a few words and then basically repeats them every now and again. So, yeah, for all intents and purposes, like I say, it's a bit of an, an instrumental of sorts. But I like it. And it's the only track which could have started the album. When you look at everything else, there's nowhere else it could have gone. It had to open the album. So I really do like it. And then next up we go with uh, Holy Mountain. Now, Holy Mountain was the one that had this big hoo-ha uh, surrounding it going back uh, whenever it came out, like a couple of months ago. And if you're on social media, well, obviously YouTube, uh, but Twitter especially, which I'm on, uh, most people are, of course, and the, the overreaction was something else. Now, I've got to be honest, when I first heard it, I mean, literally the very first time I heard it, I thought, that's different. I didn't dislike it. I'm not just saying that. I didn't think I don't like it. I didn't even think I like it. It was, oh, that's different. That's a little bit unusual. And that, to me, it was, it was immediately obvious that this is going to set a precedent for the rest of the album as Fort Knox does on the actual album. But at that time, the first thing I'd ever heard of this new material was Holy Mountain. And I thought, yeah, that's different. That's going to divide a lot of people. <coughs> Excuse me. And then sure enough, on Twitter, people had a field day. The classic line that people were coming out with was saying that it sounds like Ricky Martin's She Bangs. I didn't get it at all when I first heard that. In fact, to be perfectly honest, I, I didn't even know what the song was. I had to YouTube that song. 
I, I think I have heard it, but obviously it wasn't memorable enough for me to remember it. So I YouTubed it and I listened to the song a couple of times and I thought, am I missing something? It doesn't sound anything like it. And the only thing that I thought at the time and still think uh, is that it's where Ricky Martin says she bangs, she bangs. It's just uh, Noel Gallagher says, is it she says, she says. Uh, and that's the only similarities whatsoever between the two tracks. But I think it's one of those situations, you know, with social media these days, people do jump on bandwagons. And if celebrities start to say it, or if big circles of people start to say it, then like sheep, everybody follows. And the amount of people, like I said, which were going, it's just ripping off Ricky Martin. It's nothing like Ricky Martin. It's absolutely nothing like whatsoever that song. Now, if you think it is, you think it is, whatever. But I genuinely see no similarities whatsoever. And I do think it's that thing, like I say, of people, of somebody saying it, and then the snowball effect. And then everybody says it because all their mates are. And it's and like all the kids are like saying it. I didn't really see many adults saying it. Um, and it just became trendy and popular to say it sounds like Ricky Martin. It doesn't sound like anything like it at all. But what it does sound like is a combination, for me anyway, of, say, David Bowie, uh, even like Mud or Slade. Uh, very glam rock, very glam rock-esque from, you know, the, the early, mid kind of 70s. And almost you could throw in, and this isn't an insult because I actually really like them, but almost an element of pub rock with status quo. It's got that kind of sound to it. And so, so I like it. I think it's a really good track. It was a very bold track, you know, to put out there as a single, as the first single and the first song to introduce people to the album and this new style that Noel, go, uh, Noel Gallagher is going into or heading into. But I really, really like it. And also Paul Weller plays the organ. Little fact for you, which you may have already known. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, so yeah, I like it. Good track. Uh, next on, uh, next up is Keep On Reaching. Uh, a very kind of bluesy kind of number for me. There's a couple of songs Liam had on his last album. I can't remember. There was one called, was it Greedy Soul? I might have that wrong. And there's another one. There's two tracks on Liam's debut album, which sound very kind of almost Bob Dylan-esque, uh, very gritty, almost Stones-like, and uh, yeah, kind of bluesy. And that, to me, is the equivalent on this album. I like it. Um, not quite as in your face, as the Liam tracks, but that kind of vibe to it. It's a good track, I do like it, but uh, I wasn't blown away by it, but but it's good. Uh, next up is A Beautiful World, and that's got a really, really deep kind of bass grooves that it's got to it, which are really kind of striking. Uh, in a way, it kind of reminds me of something uh, that could be on Duran Duran's album from 2015, Paper Gods, which by the way, incidentally, is a brilliant album. I, th I don't think they've released an album since Duran Duran. It's only two years ago, so it's, a, it's still very, uh, very recent, of course. But yeah, it sounds like it could have been off something like uh, Off Paper Gods by Duran Duran. Really kind of futuristic-y, um, almost a sci-fi feel to it. And I like it, dance elements to it, a really good track. And I think it was it, It's a Beautiful World was one of the songs, along with Fort Knox and Holy Mountain and maybe one or two others, that was put out as a trailer. Noel Gallagher himself made this trailer, apparently deliberately, uh, featuring all these sounds from different songs on the album, uh, which would deliberately maybe make people stand up and take notice, thinking this is this is a bit different, this album. And I remember him putting a, a, a snippet from It's a Beautiful World on there. It must have been maybe the chorus. And I immediately loved it. I thought, I can't wait to hear that new song, the, or the song in full. And now I have, it's brilliant. Really, really like it. So that's, it's, it's a beautiful world. And um, yeah, also I should say on this song as well, it features, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. I can just see it there. Charlotte Marineur. And she's the, the French uh, backing vocalist, uh, maybe now more famous for playing the scissors. That also caused a lot of, uh, a lot of not controversy, just a talking point, I guess. A lot of talking points that that caused. Now, I've got to be honest, when I saw the scissors playing, the scissor playing taking place, or the scissors playing taking place, I thought it was a little bit weird and a little bit maybe slightly pretentious. But I, I didn't throw my toys out the pram about it. I just thought, all right, that's a bit different. And she's French. What do you expect? They're prone to uh, doing the odd thing here and there. <laughs> and so I quite like it. It's something a bit unique. It's a little bit far out, isn't it, really? 
it, it's definitely pretentious, but it's funny, it's different, it's unique. Why not? Um, game for a laugh. Why not? Why not go along with it? But in terms of backing vocals, you know, I think she did a, uh, did a, a very good job. I say backing vocals, it's more like spoken word, which is done over the top of it. Um, she talks, I think, about it being the end of the world. Um, it, it's in French, but I think that's kind of the, the, the translation. I don't panic. It's only the end of the world kind of thing. Everything will be all right. And I watched an interview, and I'll put a link, actually, in this video, in the description box, to a track-by-track track, uh, summing up that Noel Gallagher did on XFM, just going back a few days. And he said if there's one thing that he could change, I think he mentioned uh, there was another thing in the album he'd change, actually. Uh, might be in the running order. I think he said he'd put um, a song called Interlude after she taught me how to fly. But apart from that, the only thing that he said he'd change is that he wouldn't have Charlotte Marineur saying it's the end of the world. He would change it to her saying it's not the end of the world. So, you know, but either way, it kind of works. It sums up the album quite well. Um, but I guess the other way would work as well by saying it's not the end of the world because that's more positive, clearly. So anyway, it's a beautiful world, a really, really good song, a beautiful song. Next up is She Taught Me How to Fly. Now, when I immediately heard this, and Noel actually said this himself in the interview, but I didn't even need to hear that. It was obvious. It was almost like a tribute, particularly the guitar part, um, but almost like the drum machine, everything about it, but definitely the guitar part, like a tribute, if you like, um, to New Order. It sounded like something Bernard Sumner would do, and the, the guitarist, the vocalist, Bernard Sumner. And yeah, just a very obvious uh, tip of the hat to uh, to New Order. And I love New Order. They're a really, really good band. Everybody likes New Order, surely. Very upbeat as well. You know, if I'm going to put on this album, which I frequently have over the last kind of week or so, uh, this track, She Taught Me How to Fly, is one that I will go to straight away. Rather than just start the album from scratch at, at Fort Knox, I'll put on maybe something like She Taught Me How to Fly. There's a couple of other tracks like that as well, but that's one which I instantly go to. It, it struck me immediately as something that's really catchy, it's really upbeat, it's really positive, and I love New Order, so I like that kind of influence as well. So, great track. Uh, one of my favourites on the album. Next up is Be Careful What You Wish For. Now, this to me sounded like, and maybe to most people, a combination of, say, Come Together by the Beatles and also Waiting for the Rapture, which was on Oasis' last album, Dig Out Your Soul, back in 2008. It sounded exactly like it, very chilled out, um, yeah, very kind of uh, almost hippie-esque. Just imagine listening to it, smoking a joint. I don't smoke, but you can imagine people doing that to it. But yeah, a definite, a definite kind of Beatles influence going on, that kind of sort of late 60s chilled out kind of zone. For me, anyway. Next up we have Black and White Sunshine. Speaking of the Beatles, the first few seconds remind me just of Rain by the Beatles. Uh, not just in terms of the drum intro, uh, but also the guitar playing. It, it sounds very reminiscent of Rain for me. A throwback kind of 1960s song. And also in that interview, if you watch it, in the link that I'll put in the description box, like I say, Noel touched upon the fact that, for him anyway, it sounds almost like American kind of surf pop, almost like R.E.M. And I see where he's going with that. It does sound like something that maybe Peter Buck would, uh, would be performing on, on an R.E.M. track. So I really like it. It's, it's another really good song. Initially, it was one which I kind of, I, when I say I skipped, I mean, I'd listened to it, but I wasn't massively keen on it. But it's one of those where I kind of like the intro to it and then I lose a little bit of interest. And when that R.E.M. kind of style influence kicks in, I really like it. So, uh, yeah, I've grown to like that song quite a lot. Not my favourite, but a very good track nonetheless. Next up, we've got Interlude, which only lasts just over a couple of minutes. It's, uh, it was written on a Wednesday. It's, well, it's actually called Interlude, and in brackets, Wednesday Part 1, just because apparently it was written on a Wednesday. So it's broken into two parts. There's the Part 1, and then there's a Part 2 in a second. So I'll talk more about that track. Uh, interlude and the add-on to it, the continuation in a second. After that we have If Love Is The Law. I really like this one. This was probably, when I put it on, my favourite track. Instantly loved it. Uh, it's almost like a Christmas song, constantly from the start and all the way through. You've got the sleigh bells going, uh, so it's, it's very kind of Christmas inspired, almost. Not so much in the lyrics, but with the sleigh bells going on in the background. Uh, very 60s inspired as well, a clear tip to the hat to the 1960s. Um, and that kind of hippie kind of thing of just make love, not war. Very kind of uh, positive, upbeat, 
which is very reminiscent of a lot of the album, quite frankly, uh, despite the, the, the undertones earlier on of, uh, you know, we'd be in the end of the world with that French spoken voice. Um, it's, it's actually a, a very positive message that I uh, interpreted in anyway. So uh, Johnny Mars also on this one, he plays the mouth organ. The mouth organ, when I first heard it, this is a weird one, very much of left field, but it reminded me of a track by the House Martins called Pirate Agro, which I remember from when I was a kid. And the House Martins with Paul Heaton, an amazing band. If you, if you don't know them, I'm sure you do, but if you don't, you've got to check out the House Martins, a brilliant band. Paul Heaton, of course, went on to form The Beautiful Self. And, and they're a very good band too. So yeah, Johnny Marr features on this, but it's a really good, positive song, and possibly my favourite, certainly one of my favourites on the album. Then we've got the, the Man Who Built the Moon. This is the proper, or the last proper full kind of song uh, on the record. A really kind of epic, crunching intro. Very kind of haunting, uh, very movie-like. It's another one where in this interview, if you watch it, Noel said it sounds very kind of James Bond-esque. But he didn't even have to say that, but because before I watched that video, that was the impression that I got. It sounded very much like, you know, you can imagine watching a James Bond movie and it's either the intro or maybe the outro. You can see all the villains are on screen and you can just imagine this song playing to it. Uh, very, very much inspired, uh, I think anyway, by uh, something like James Bond. So a brilliant track. I have heard a few people give it a bit of a lukewarm reception and maybe give it a kind of, you know, like a 6 out of 10 rating, uh, or worse. But for me, it's a brilliant track, um, an easy 8, if not higher, probably even a 9. I really, really like it. It's a great way to end the album when it comes to a full song. And I say that because the album actually technically ends with a song called End Credits, in brackets, Wednesday Part 2. So like I say, this is the continuation of Interlude, just a few tracks above it, Wednesday Part 1. And... Yeah, it's a very chilled out, uh, very kind of um, French movie inspired soundtrack. It's like, it's almost like, it's like being in New York. This is a bit weird. I'm just going with this off the top of my head. It's like being in New York. No, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like watching a movie and in the movie, someone is going into like a cinema in New York in the 70s. And the movie that they're watching in the movie that you're watching is like a French movie. So they're in the cinema watching this and you're watching them watching that. It's a bit convoluted, isn't it? And over the top of it, you can imagine like kind of French voices talking over it in a very kind of um, cheesy kind of, or soothing kind of way. It's yeah, very, very French ridden, that song. And it's, that's certainly not a, an insult, that's a compliment. It sounds very, very good. Very much something again from the 70s. So that kind of sums up the album for me in the sense that it's very 70s inspired or inspired with certain obvious hints of the 1960s in there as well with Beatles-esque, uh, almost Mamas and the Papas and that kind of era uh, influences. Uh, Beach Boys, a little bit of that going on, just basically things from the 60s, but predominantly the 70s with a hint of the 80s with, on top of that, maybe modern things like a primal scream and a happy Mondays and all that kind of stuff. It's a whole amalgamation a mixture of all Noel's influences and then a load of other things which maybe he's recently discovered and opened his mind to. And that's what you get with this album. So without question, it's completely different to what he's done in the past. It's not like his other two uh, High Flying Bird albums. It's nothing like Oasis. Although with that said, if you look at Oasis's last album, Dig Out Your Soul, and in fact all their albums, they were kind of progressively heading to the point where we're kind of at. So for me, where Noel Gallagher is now, it's just a natural progression. People have often criticised him for always sounding the same. Now, maybe it's because I'm a bit of a fanboy, maybe I'm biased, but I genuinely never thought that Oasis albums have sounded the same. Influenced and elements of, of the previous album sounding like the last one, yeah, absolutely. But, or I say the previous sound like the last, the, the previous one sounding like the next one, I guess. Yeah, they, they do sound the same, of course. It's the same songwriter uh, with Noel Gallagher being at the helm. But they've always kind of moved on for me. And this album is just, uh, it's reached like kind of a crescendo. And he's 50 years of age and he's just happy to try something new. And, and for me, anything less than this now would be a backward step. He's kind of set a precedent. I don't want to see old Oasis records, not really, maybe in the future, but for the foreseeable future, I want to see more records coming out like this, 
more experimentation, more sounds from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, more left field things, more um, very niche kind of sounds. I want to see more albums like this going forward, but that's just me. Uh, I did see a review from the Irish Times, which the guy gave it one out of five, which is so farcical on every level, it was an embarrassment. I think there was 11 paragraphs in that, inter in that uh, review, and every single one of them contained a dig, uh, talking about Noel's age, saying that he was 50, talking about how he was a Manchester City fan, uh, in a negative way as well. I mean, what's that got to do with the record? Every single paragraph, it's like there was a hidden agenda, maybe he just doesn't like Oasis, maybe he had a run-in with uh, the brothers or Noel in the past. It was very evident from the off that this guy didn't like them, he didn't like the album, and I just thought it was a farce. Because if you look at every other review which has gone up, we're talking four out of five minimum. So this one guy obviously had an agenda, uh, maybe he just wants to be famous for five minutes. Uh, I, I don't know what his problem was, but it was absolutely ridiculous. But for me, I, I love the album. That's my summing up of the album. I absolutely love it. I'm not disappointed whatsoever. I'm not just pleasantly surprised, but I'm overwhelmingly surprised. I really, really love it. It's my favourite album this year by anybody, although I may be getting carried away with it because it's just come out, so it's the only thing I'm listening to. Uh, maybe when I look back in hindsight, it may not be, but it, it probably will be. I really like it. All the tracks are really strong. And uh, even the, the, the bonus track, which isn't on this, it's on the CD version, as I showed earlier on. That's called Dead in the Water. And what I love about that, you see, a lot of people have come out and they've said, oh, you should have re-recorded it, because the actual recording on the CD is a live recording. And I believe it's the only time to date that he's actually done the song, played the song. And But what I love about it is it sounds so perfect. It's raw. Uh, the emotion is there. It's, he doesn't miss a beat, he doesn't miss a key, he doesn't do anything wrong, it sounds perfect. And also, a great thing about that track is maybe a quarter of the way through or halfway through, a guy starts playing along on what I think is the piano, uh, or the organ, whatever it is, or the keyboard. I think it's the piano though. And the guy who is playing it is just uh, like a session musicianist, maybe he's one of the members of the High Flying Birds, I'm, I'm not sure, but he's someone who you know, knows, obviously, he did just appear from nowhere. And he started just impulsively, just kind of ad lib, just going along with the, the song as Noel was playing it live. But it's, you'd never guess that because it sounds as if it should have been and, and was part of the, the arrangement. It goes so well. It just sounds so perfect. And I think for that reason, because it's captured in time with all everything aligning, it just everything about it is perfect. So it's a sad song, but at the same time, kind of very positive kind of message overall but I think for that reason with all those stars aligning I think that's why he didn't re-record it because it just worked and I'm sure one day he probably will re-record it and stick it on an album or a, a best of or a compilation but I really personally like how they just went with the the raw sound of that original recording and just stuck it on the record or on the CD technically uh, so I really like that track uh, although technically, like I said, it's not part of the album because it's a bonus track on the CD version and on the Japanese version as well. So, yeah, it's, it's an album where Noel is trying something new. With Liam's album, as much as I do like it, and I really do, and I talked about, about it and I did the video for it, but with that album, it didn't really... It didn't do anything which surprised me. It was just a Liam Gallagher album. It, everything on that album was something I expected from Liam Gallagher where with Noel, he tends to constantly push that creativity envelope, that, that little bit more, always looking to do something else. You know, in the past, he's worked with the likes of the Chemical Brothers and Goldie and recently Gorillaz with Damon Albarn. Who would have predicted that one? So he's always been happy to do something different. You know, you look at the influences which he cited in the past, like the Happy Mondays, New Order, Primal Scream. My uncle's cousin, by the way, I think I've said before, well, I know I've said before, my uncle's cousin was the drummer in Primal Scream, believe it or not, from 88, 89 up until about 95. True story, that. So, I mean, even though it's not technically a blood relation, my uncle's cousin, but whatever. So, but yeah, so the point being that Noel has always, you know, is cited these extra influences. It's not just about the Beatles. It's not just about the Stones. He'll listen to dance music growing up, going to the Hacienda. 
all the influences of dance music and club culture. And he's always embraced it and he's never shone away from that. And you see that with his records, always looking to do something new. And Liam, and it's not a criticism, but Liam, you know what you're going to get. He's rock and roll, he's swagger. He doesn't want to do anything else. Not really. That's his thing. And he does that best. But that's why I've always preferred Noel, I've, in my opinion. I love them both, but I always like someone who's going to try something new. And with Noel Gallagher, that's what you get. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much repeating myself here. And this, this video is going on a long time as a result. So, in my opinion, I absolutely love it. I think it's, it's an incredible album. And I urge everybody just to go out there and give it a chance. Don't listen to the nonsense about Ricky Mai. It doesn't sound anything like it. Um, yes, it's not an Oasis record. But, of course, it isn't. Because Oasis, uh, you know, they split up ten years ago. And, uh, and that sound that a lot of people want still want, still crave for, it was back in the 90s, the mid-90s. It's 2018 in a month. So I think you've got to move with the times. It's nice to look back at the past, but we'll always have those Oasis records. But I personally, I don't want to see another, definitely maybe, I don't want to see another, even a Be Here Now. I That's there in the past. I've always got access to it. I loved it. I lived through it. It was amazing. But you've got to move on and I absolutely love this record so um, yeah it'll be interesting to see what you think if you don't like it then you know let's not have an argument about it let's be adult about it tell me what you don't like about it uh, there's no harm in you wanting that Oasis be here now or definitely maybe what's a story morning glory sound I hear you I absolutely do hear you it's, it's brilliant I love it I'm a massive fan of it I loved it back in the day and I always will but I guess just maybe for me musically I'm quite progressive uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be regressive, if you like, but I'm I'm quite progressive and I want to see new things. So, yeah, let me know what you think, whether you like it, whether you don't, but give it a chance. Give it a chance. Don't listen to other people. And I think you'll really like it. And I've not seen the charts. I'm not even sure if it's been released, but it's obviously going to go to number one. I laugh if it doesn't now, but it clearly is. And that in itself, that will tell you a bit of a story that people still want to listen to Noel Gallagher and are still happy despite the criticism from some to uh, to embrace it and give it a chance so yeah there we are who built the moon 2017 came out last week I absolutely adore it it's brilliant thank you for watching see you later